Hello to everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and Uniscape for this occasion, and also to bring you the greetings from Professor Luigi Latini, who couldn't be here today. Uh, this research that I'm going to present to you has been carried out for Fondazione Benetton Studi Ricerche in 2018, and under the guidance of Professor Latini and Simonetta Zanon, and with the support of Uniscape. Uh, this is a six monthly research addressing a very vast topic such as um, landscape architecture training in Europe. So I would like you to consider it uh, not like a point of arrival, but more like a start of a reflection on this theme. The very first step in this research was trying to trace a scenario of the current offer of uh, training in landscape architecture in Europe. And therefore, we carried out a survey uh, taking into account almost all the countries adhering to IFA Europe, uh, with the exception of Russia, Ukraine, and uh, Israel. Uh, this survey was, was made basically mainly on the websites of schools and universities. and. Uh, the framework outlined gave interesting information since in most of the cases you can access to the study plans and the syllabus. And so to get an idea of how the courses were, were structured, for example, one thing that I found interesting was to notice where and which courses integrated uh, subjects like climate change or participatory planning in their um, courses. But um, we felt very soon the need to kind of put into a time perspective this scenario in order to gather information about the cultural derivations uh, which led to the scenario itself. And so we decided to um, focus or on a narrow number of countries, the seven you can see here, and for these countries, the research uh, aim was to um, outline the key roles in the development of, of landscape architecture as, a, as an academic field. Um, by key roles, I mean key figures, uh, the role of the state and of politics, the role of um, professional associations and so on. And by doing this, we always kept in mind how um, the interaction between um, educational world and uh, the professional one, since they look like the two sides of the same coin. Um, and so for this reason, we, we tried also to uh, think, take into account uh, the job opportunity, especially in the public sector, since this is um, a clue, an important clue about the recognition of the profession in, in the different countries. For some of these countries, um, I also interviewed a few scholars uh, at, in order to gather uh, an inner inside point of view on the, on the state of the art. So we can see in this room there is Professor Bas Pedroli, which, which is one of the people <laughs> I interviewed, and I thank him for the information. So talking about this development, uh, it has commonly been divided into different phases, starting from 1919, which is the year we know about the first course was set in Norway in us. And even looking at this simple uh, scheme, we can notice how uh, the major phases involved with the um, birth of uh, landscape architecture courses are closely related in time with um, historical moments of social change. Uh, so we can notice the first wave uh, happened right after the Second World War, so uh, with the needs of the post-war reconstruction, and, and it, um, it happened mostly in northern and northern west Europe. And the second wave uh, in the 90s happened after, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, so uh, mostly in uh, north, uh, I mean in east and southeast of Europe. But this dynamic is true also for singular cases like Spain itself, 
And we can see in this country, the first course uh, was set in Barcelona in 1980, right after Francoism, as a need to reappropriate uh, public space. Um, our current phase has been defined as a phase of cooperation since there is a relaunching of international cooperation, especially after political acts like um, the European Landscape Convention, obviously, and uh, the Bologna process, uh, which indicates a common area for uh, higher education in, in Europe. Uh, here in this scheme, I wanted to point out uh, Norway as a, a corner mark, but then uh, all the countries considered in, the, in this research. And you can see in red um, the, day, uh, the, the year of the foundation of the first training course, and in blue the date uh, for, of the professional association. But something really interesting to me uh, about this pioneer phase um, is how uh, the birth of the first courses is really due to uh, the work of key figures. And you can see the names here in this scheme. These key figures were pioneers of the discipline that were able to um, both act uh, both in the academic field and the professional field. And so in many cases, there are not only uh, the ones who led to the birth of the first training course, but also the ones who set the professional association in their country. And um, by doing so, by their work, they were actually defining a new definition of landscape architecture since it was coming from um, garden design or horticulture to become what we kn know as a modern uh, themes of uh, landscape architecture. So following the needs of the new century and the complexity of the 20th century. Uh, and in this, um, as Professor Lambertini was saying before, uh, the pioneers so had a common dynamic to in Europe to what happened before, a few years before in, uh, in North America. Um, so, these pioneers were able to set an international network of exchange who led to the birth of IFLA in uh, 1948. And this relationship uh, was professional but led into real friendships sometimes. And by these graphics, I, 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 I wanted to synthesize and symbolize how this clue dynamic of international exchange has been, since the very beginning of our discipline, uh, a major ingredient for its growth. So <laughs> we can see some of these pioneers for some of the countries. And I wanted to uh, show you this picture, which is uh, Porcinai's passport, because we can see it as a clue of uh, you know, how many stamps and so of the traveling of these people. Uh, here there's a very nice picture of a gathering in, uh, in Denmark in 1949. And so I tried to, uh, <laughs> to look at this as uh, traveling before low cost fares. So probably very expensive, but very, um, uh, I can't have <laughs> the word now, but like powerful. Um, so I wanted to just give you a very fast uh, glimpse of um, some of the outputs of this um, research. And by doing so, I meant to uh, talk about Portugal, first of all, because uh, you can see here the, the current uh, education programs in, in Portugal. I would like to talk about Portugal since it's a very emblematic case uh, of both the role of these pioneers and of the role played by international exchange. And also because Portugal, it's a case in itself in the context of Southern Europe, uh, since here landscape architecture anticipated over a few decades uh, the majority of the other Southern country. 
And also because, as you can see here, um, Portugal has been defined as the best example if you want to understand ecological thinking in, in the south of Europe. Uh, and you can have a, a clue of it even by looking at the study plans of the five schools. And landscape architecture courses here were born in science and technological faculties, something which is uncommon for the, south, for the majority of the, the countries in Southern Europe where they mainly came out of architecture. Mm. The history and the peculiarities of this uh, are to be found uh, mainly in this figure. He is Francisco Caldera Cabral. Uh, he's, the, he's considered to be the pioneer of landscape architecture in Portugal. Uh, he was active in IFLA since 1950, and he's also been uh, the vice president for IFLA for two years since uh, 58 to the 60. Uh, the municipality of Lisbon, when, when he was still a student, wanted him to become the chief of the Department of Parks and Gardens after a period of specialization abroad, which he chose to carry in Germany. So uh, Cabral attended in Germany uh, in the Friedrich Wilhelm University from 36 to 39 under the guidance of this other man who is Irish speaking, who is one of the pioneers of uh, landscape architecture training in Germany. Here, there is another very interesting story that I won't uh, tell, but uh, he, with, together with Alwin Seifert, he's one of the two main um, landscape architects working for the Third Reich. So it's really interesting, this, but... Anyway, they, um, uh, Cabral and Wilking um, built a strong professional relation and also a friendship that lasted for all their lives. But what is interesting in our point of view is that Cabral came in touch with the holistic approach to landscape architecture they had in Germany at the time, and he brought it back to um, Portugal in the 40s, where he set the first course of landscape architecture in ISA, in uh, um, Instituto Superior de Agronomia in Lisbon. And the German influence was really clear uh, in the course structured by Cabral. Uh, it was focused on a technical training and on natural and physical components of the landscape. So this course set up a model in Portugal. And through this course, Cabral trained the first generation of landscape architects in the country. And oh, <laughs> I'm already late. <laughs> <laughs> and among them, we can see Roberto Tellish, who set uh, a course itself in Evora, uh, and he was also minister, so he brought the uh, issue of landscape architecture in the public debate. So I, I will try to be very, very fast and talk also about <laughs> Great Britain for another reason, since here, of course, we have a pioneer, a pioneer here too, Geoffrey Jellicoe, and, but... Um, What's really interesting about Great Britain is the, uh, is the period of post-war reconstruction and, and the role of the professional um, association. Uh, in general, the topic of post-war reconstruction is very interesting since it led to different consequences in the different countries. For example, in France, uh, landscape architects were involved in the projects of Grands Ensemble, while in Italy it did not happen so much. And so this led to different recognition for our discipline. But uh, in, um, in the UK, the Newtowns Act of 1946 gave landscape architects in the UK new tasks, extending their field of action from garden design to a much broader scale of intervention. So the professional association at the time realized British landscape architects were not prepared for these new tasks, and there were too few. And what's interesting, they, um, they sent letters directly to universities and to ministries in order to force them to broaden the scope of study plans and to set new courses in order to guarantee the growth of the profession. But the role played by... Um, 
the professional association who was called uh, Institute of Landscape Architecture, now it's called Landscape, Landscape Institute since 1978. Um, it's that it still plays a great role in keeping uh, education um, standards committed to the professional requirements. And so I just wanted to very briefly um, talk about the pathway to chartership because Landscape Institute um, recognizes uh, the, the courses in Great Britain. So if you attend uh, one of the courses recognized by Land Landscape Institute after, you can be listed as a member of Landscape Institute. But they, they have a higher level of qualification with this, this part, pathway to chartership which leads to be a chartered member of Landscape Institute. And this is a long uh, path. Uh, the average is two years after graduation. And this is a proof of um, the strong role that uh, Landscape Institute still plays, um, the professional association still plays for education uh, in, uh, in Great Britain. So uh, this control, oh, these are pioneers, but okay. This control dynamic um, worked well in keeping education updated with the professional needs. At some point, they had uh, a lack of um, the research field in training, since, of course, the research field is sometimes felt by the professionals less important. But uh, this was a few decades ago, and now we can see in their study programs they have many um, master degrees dedicated to research in landscape architecture. Okay, I'm going to skip on this. <laughs> and this is a, a crazy final graph just to, because what I wanted to, um, to tell you as a brief con conclusion, uh, these were of course just uh, brief uh, outcomes of the research, and, but this survey was not meant to be read uh, just in an historical point of view. Uh, the aim was also to build awareness about the key roles that can lead and strengthen today uh, landscape architecture training. And so also it seemed important uh, in a period where we um, have been wondering for some time about the existence or the possibility even to define a common European approach to landscape, to landscape architecture. Uh, it looked important to me to state how international exchange has always been a key element in the development of our discipline. And so I think that keeping a shared reflection like in moments like today, it's uh, something very important. So thank you.